Okay, I want to start the net by saying welcome everybody. Um, I'm I'm having uh, a little bit of a crazy week here. I just want to take about two two or three minutes and just tell you what kind of week I've had, so you understand when I'm I am not at full strength tonight. I doubt I'm at half strength tonight. Um, I've had a really really rough week. Um, this week started out with my host being told that he's been exposed to COVID and he has to stay home and do our show from his house. Oh, yeah. That's how my week started. So we're running equipment back and forth. We're stringing stuff up. We're trying to figure it out. We found out something. His house has a crappy internet connection. They gave us a fit for four days. It went right down in the middle of segments and I'd have to start talking because he's gone. I mean, it was, it was a, a horrible frazzled week of four horrible shows that sounded like crap on the air and some of the worst stuff we've done in two years. I'm going to, I'm going to admit it. It's crap. He, he was fine. I was fine as far as I pressed the buttons the best I could, but it was crap. It was what came out the other end. While that's going on, I've got an infected tooth that I'm on antibiotics for that's firing up like you wouldn't believe. So you're going to see me take drinking a lot of ice water tonight in case it starts swelling up. Uh, I've got two or three other health issues I won't explain because it involves things that men generally don't talk about. Um, but just let's just say, oh man, I've been sick lately and it hasn't been good. So all that aside, I'm going to put that aside. The engine in my van started tapping this week. It's going to go out soon. I'm done. It's got 200,000 miles on it. Um, I've been out of work for five months and I'm, uh, I've never been here before. This is a cool place. Uh, I've never asked for government assistance on anything, and I, I still haven't, but uh, I'm telling you, it's getting close. And so all I'm, all I'm telling you guys this for is two reasons. One, if you know somebody selling a really cheap car, let me know. <laughs> and number two, forgive me for this crappy ass net tonight, please. We'll try, all right? Please. I, I, it's, I, I normally do a better deal than this. Uh, I just, I feel like tonight, I told, this is totally a letdown. But that being said, let's put it together and do what we can. It's open lines night. Uh, and I want to other, also say uh, that uh, the, the highlight of my week was, uh, was Lunch Bunch. I really appreciate you guys. I, by the time I leave there, I'm all smiles. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the three compu old computers you gave me to, uh, uh, to work on and to uh, see if I can integrate into some crazy project that will somewhere involve a radio. And... Um, I don't know. Beyond that, I think I'm actually going to take one of those and make a win, just a, a dedicated WinLink computer and hook it up to a dedicated Chinese WinLink radio or somehow. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to do it, but I want to set up a WinLink terminal that's on all the time in my shack and I, and, and uh, it's ready to go at a moment's notice. I don't know for hey, some Ian? reason. Yeah. Ian? Yeah. You go can ahead. use the, um, the Bofangs uh, with the appropriate cable and it's it's sold at the uh, uh, what is that the signal link usb website uh, to be able to use your bofang ht to run your tnc and do winlink packet that way um, i've done it and it works believe it or not through a hg well, and I bought that cable. It's got like a, a headphone connector on one end and it's got the double deal on the other end for the, uh, do you guys mind if we talk about this for a minute? No, no, um, no, no. It actually got, it's got the big round, not, not a headphone connector, but it's got that big round. I think it's a six or eight pin um, oh. that plugs into the back of the TNC. Oh, so you still need a TNC. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you got to have what, some way to convert what your do you audio. Need to, but let me yeah. ask a question. It what that, do you, it works? I, I've done it down here. It works. <laughs> what do you need the TNC for? That's just to initiate the transmission? Is that all you need the TNC for? To tell the radio to transmit? That's the transmitter, and yeah, it does the push a talk and the relay through it. Yes, from what I understand. Okay. Uh, well, all I know is it it works. Keep, it keep works. in mind that the TNC translates the text from the computer into tones that the radio transmits. Okay, so so it does work differently than because I'm very confused because apparently FM stuff works differently on VHF and UHF than HF stuff over here on upper sideband. I hear apparently I'm understanding 
This one you can do with just a sound card, the, the HF. But but the uh, but the the uh, the other one, um, apparently the FM and AM or the FM one over here on the uh, the VHF and the UHF, you have to have a a middle piece, a TNC. Well, and, not and necessarily. I, you could run the uh, you could run the thing from your computer with software on the computer like Direwolf. And then all you need is a sound card between the, uh, the computer and the radio. Ah, so that's what it is. There's software that needs to convert it into those tones you're talking about, basically. Yes, sir. Basically, what right, you right. do is hardware or implemented software. Oh, he's writing that one down. The, uh, the way that I set up my Go box is to have my FTM 100 on one side of it on the top half. The other side, I have a Bofang 2501 plus 220 on the left side. And I have my uh, TNCX in the middle. And I've got the appropriate cables for either radio to be able to handle doing the, the wind link stuff and being able to keep the other radio up for voice transmissions. Mm. Yeah, that's I, I was working on that with... Uh with the HF, I got the HF rig hooked up right to my sound card and I used a Vox on the HF rig. My HF rig can read the other station, but I only, I didn't do it for very long. And then all this started happening early last week. And I actually, and this is kind of a crazy thing, but my host needed this. I use, this as my, uh, this is my production sound call card. It's called a uh, Scarlet Focus, right? I don't know if you guys can see that. It's a focus, right? And we use this in radio. This, if, if I'm going to send a guy home, so Trey did the show uh, actually the last couple of days with something like with this one. I, I sent this down there with him and, and he used this. Um, and basically all it is is mic inputs and headphones, headphone out and then USB into your computer. But here's what makes this great for broadcasting. It has what they call mix minus, which I'm sure most of you guys know what that is, but it mixes my real time headphones with the feed coming into it from the computer. So everything's everything sounds to me like it's normal. Um, I realized early on that this could be and by the way, yeah, I'm using this for this right now. That's why it's actually you're hearing me through this right now. Um, what's really cool about this is I hooked this directly up to my HF radios. I've actually used it now with both of them. And it actually works great with both of them. I come out of my FT100. The two pins that come out are not voltage charged. I went right into, uh, uh, I literally made a little terminal connection and went right into uh, a, a plug for this. Came right out of the headphones, right into the mic. Turn the volume down to start, work your way up. And then I did the same thing on the other end. I came out the headphones in the back and I went to the mic in the front, started really low. <laughs> And I'm doing FT8 with that. I'm doing all kinds of digital modes. And like I said, I think I'm going to be able to do HF Winlink. And that's, that's kind of my thing I'm going to be working on a lot this weekend. I want to get the HF Winlink. And then, of course, I need to get the FM Winlink going, too. Um, my goal is to get it to where we can pass traffic out of the area. Because I think that's just as important as passing it locally. So... Yeah, that, that may actually be more important because uh, being able to get good and welfare messages out and status messages out to, to friends and family, you know, if the internet is down and, you know, we, we can connect to the, the Winlink server or, you know, uh, point to point between our stations to, to relay stuff for, for shelters, wonderful for, for supporting the county. But, you know, the other side of that coin is, you know, we may not all be at, at a county shelter supporting a shelter and we may need to get good welfare messages, you know, out of the area if they're, if the internet's down or phone lines are down, something like that. Um, so anybody that's got HF rigs, uh, you know, start working with forwarding messages through Winlink. Yeah, I'm going to be working with it. I just got to figure out how to do it. Like I said, I'm still, I, I have done a lot of reading on it and I know that uh, there's a lot to it and I, I'm going to be working on it again this weekend. I want to get the HF, I think I can get the HF stuff going this weekend, but and, and now that you gave me the name of that, um, you called it Diowolf? Dire, D-I-R-E-W-O-L-F, Dire Wolf. 
Okay, I, I wrote Beowulf, and I know that wasn't it. So okay, <laughs> that's, um, that's that's a, that's a rifle. That's a rifle. That's yeah, it. and then Beowulfing, and then it's it's going all over the place in my head, and it's not working. So anyway, okay, I got that. With that, I might be able to do the whole dealy do here. Well, I think, you're not uh, going to need Direwolf though to do HF when Link. You don't need it for HF. You do need it for the the FM, correct? Right. Okay. Good. All right. That's that's what I understand because the HF, I'm able to hear them and it's having a hard time connecting. But the one day I was doing it, the the, the signal was were weak. I only had like two shots and they were both weak. So I think if I have better conditions or do it late at night, you know, when I, I know I can get on 40 or 80 and have better conditions, um, I'm sure I can do it. Because, okay, you know, a wire is antenna is something that's real easy to take down before the storm, real easy to put up after the storm. It's probably easier after the storm because a lot of the crap's cleaned out and you get more branch, less branches to deal with. Uh, well, what were you saying, Steve? Okay, one, yeah. one minor uh, comment on, uh, on John's last comment, and that is... For VHF, you either either need a TNC between the radio and the computer, or you need a dire wolf and a sound card. Either or, not both. If you go with the sound card, you need dire wolf. If you go with a TNC, you do not. Right. Okay. Got it. Dire wolf takes the place of the modem. Essentially, dire wolf is a software TNC. And then you just use the Vox feature on your radio, and that's how it knows to turn itself on the transmit. I mean, that's how I do it anyway. Yeah. Another and, thing uh, uh, on your HF, uh, if you don't make a connect in, in a couple of tries, try another station uh, because it's uh, it's possible that station's busy and it's not going to acknowledge you. But uh, sometimes I have to try three or four different stations to get a message out of here on hf yes agreed um and i've actually found in, in my own personal instance that i actually have better options connecting further away so if you see a station that's 150 miles away you think that's going to be good i've actually had better luck hitting stuff that's five and seven hundred miles away yeah here here on uh on uh 75 meters and on 40 meters uh, I have uh, good luck like 300 miles away, but most of the time I connect with a guy in Mississippi or a guy in uh, in Houston, uh, and I get my traffic out through them, and those are usually on 20 meters. Dave, have you had any problem with the one in Mississippi recently? I haven't connected with him recently. Uh, Houston's been kind of... I active, have not but been you know, able to connect with him. He used to be the most reliable one, and... I wonder if that station's not off the air or having problems or something, because I haven't been able to connect with him in a couple of weeks. But don't forget, Houston's also had all that snow and ice mess, so. Well, I, I haven't done anything in a week uh, through Houston, but because uh, I, I, I did, uh, I got on early, so I was able to do it on 75 meters. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the call for uh, Mississippi is uh, a W5H something. H-U-P, I think. H-U-P, yeah, okay. I found a website that uh, shows you which stations are up or something, and it showed you like which ones would be best to try first from your location. Uh, I, don't, I, I forgot what website that was. I'm not prepared to do that tonight here, but. Is that better than uh, using the uh, program? The VAR HF program where it tells you what you, you download the current data and it tells you who's best. I'm not familiar with VARA or any of that. Can anybody answer that? How are you doing HF? What are you using for HF transmission? I think we might have lost the person that asked the question. I'm not sure. No, Ian, Ian, Dave was yeah. asking you, uh, what are you using for your HF connections? Are you using oh. the RDOP or the VARA? And if you're using VARA, how do you select your stations? Um, I'm not sure. I was, it was the WinLink program and I was following the instructions. Like I said, I just started playing with it. 
Um, okay. I, you need, I know I went up to the top and I selected, uh, it's not the one we use for the local one. There's one, it was in the, you know, all the ones for HF and I, I was working through those. Yeah. Is there, can you throw your Winlink program up on the screen for a minute? Yeah. Yeah, this way we can all look at it. We can, we can, hey, everybody hey, can I'm sort of a, walk everybody through. I am 100% all for it. Um, so the, that's the that's the best way to do tech calls is to see what the user is doing and be like oh they're clicking on you know something they thought is what we're talking about and it's actually the opposite so yeah no, it's, it's the best way to do it. John, are you going to take him through it or or you want me or I I'd be happy to or if okay. any of you are welcome to help out or chime in or do it or whatever. Better to have just one voice talking to him than a mouth to When you get that screen, say yes, update. Oh, you didn't mean okay. Then let's start it again. I mean, you don't you don't need to go back and do it, but well, I'm as, in between now. Hold okay. on, let's just do it. Let's just do it. As, as a general go. rule, when you have that option to update, say yes. See, as a general rule, when someone asks me to update something, I say no. With no, you can do it because yeah. while you're on the internet, you might not have the option or the ability to update it later if you get deployed and don't have an internet connection to do that update. So if you're on the internet, do the update, do the update, and do the update until you walk out your door. Yeah, that's very that's very good advice. Yeah, that's very good advice. That's what you should do. And that reaction of mine simply comes from scar tissue that's been built up over the years by Bill Gates. Yes, yes, I know. I've, I've done 20 years of computer support, I know. But uh, yeah, in this particular you know instance, if you update, tissue. do it while you can. You, you know of this brain scar tissue that I speak. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's half of my height. That's why I'm six and a half feet tall. Why I'm running Linux. <laughs> All right, don't... Uh, there you go. All my private emails are up there, you know, sending We're porn back and forth and stuff. No, I'm just kidding. It's just Steve and I going, hey, is it working? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's working. <laughs> Tell us what you would do to get on HF Winlink. Oh, God, I don't. I did this like one time. I thought it was uh, it was one of these down here. Nope, that's point to point. Okay. Well, yeah, the P2P is peer to peer. So that's to go direct with another station. Okay, I'm being totally, I, when I tell you guys that I literally played with it, I went through the instructions one time, tried to send one, it didn't go, uh, and then disaster struck, and I haven't been back. It's been a week. Okay. So I just, I'm telling you guys, as far as I'm listening, and I want you guys to teach me, but I don't remember exactly what I did, and it didn't work, whatever it was, so tell me what to do. Okay. Don't worry about any of the P2P right now. That's something after you get your feet wet that we can go into a little more. Okay. But on up from where you are right now, the two things you want to be concerned with is the one that says RDOP Winlink and the one that says VARA HF Winlink. Next down, down, right there, and the next one down. Click on the next one down. That one there? No. Var, yeah, VAR HF. Yeah, you're right. Click on that. Now, I, I want you guys to realize that it's not connected to the radio because we're using that sound card for this right now. I understand. Yeah. So see up at the top where it's, well, oh, okay. First of all, how would you select a station to, to connect to? I don't remember how I did that. Uh, okay, because it probably. Oh yeah, this. Yeah, I remember this screen. Yes, and we want to all, always say yes. My buddies tell me anytime there's an update, always say yes. Yes, because that will give you the most recent propagation values Why to give you the best best path est estimates for your the stations that you want to try to get to at that point in time. They may be good tonight. They might be you know worthless tomorrow morning. In an hour, this could be completely different. Absolutely, yeah. So the ones at the top are the ones that predictively you should be able to get to the most easily. 
Right. Uh, and from here, you want to pay attention to the frequency mm -hmm. column to make sure that your radio can handle that frequency band. So if you're not set up to do 75 or 80 meters on your antenna, don't look at the 3500 series options. Look at the 7100 series options into the 40 meter. So scroll yeah. down a little bit. And, you know, depending on what antenna you have available to you, you you're not going to want to try to transmit at 35595 if your antenna is not set up for that, you want to maybe go to that KK4 NTE uh, down about five lines from where your mouse is, because that's at a 7100 frequency. You might have to go into the 14s or the 10s. Um, it's all based on your antenna and your equipment that you have available to you. Okay, Ian, I've had good luck with N4 SER. That's your top line. And I've had good luck with K, uh, AK4 SK. Uh, but all those were uh, early morning on thir on 35 megahertz. Uh, yeah, I mean, right. Yeah, these are all good. Now, I'm sure this this must adjust per, uh, for the daytime and nighttime bands because here's all your daytime bands down here. So that it is adjust that, by the hour. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. OK, you can see at the top where it says update via Internet. Yeah, well, yeah. You just, you click that and it'll take a couple minutes to go through it. Oh, wow. See it OK. Loading. See that line below your, your, yeah, it's loading now. It's yeah, pulling out a full update list at this point. So it's going to update all the, the path reliability estimates and the quality estimates so at that point in time when you click that button. So it's all there. So, and I know you're not con connected to a radio, so you can't actually do this, but when you are connected, and you choose one of these and try to connect, if it doesn't go to the next one or the next one on the band that you want. When you find one that connects, mm -hmm. see this little thing that says add to favorites? Down, down, right, uh, right, right. No. To the right, there you go. Yeah, I got it right there, yeah. That'll add that one. And then you've got a little drop down box just to the left of that. Okay. And once you Go ahead and click on add to favorites. Get reliably, you've got your list made there. Nice. So there and now you, you will have a pre populated list for stations that you can connect to. And I, I can, um, on my rig for me, I, anyway, I, I can do 80. Uh, it just, I can't get close to one. It's, it's like uh, 1 1.3 or 1 1.4 to ones as close as I can get. Oh, uh, it it you know, really likes 40. I can get one. You're, you're one good at on that 40. point. Now, what do you have? What do you have for rig control software? So um, that I, when you, when I you have, pick a station, when you pick a station that. off of this list, it will automatically pick the proper dial frequency for you, as opposed to you having to manually tune it. I, yeah. I went through that on my 897 Delta for about three months until I got the right software to my computer to do the rig control so that this program could automatically connect or automatically set up the frequency on my radio for me. But once you get it done, it's wonderful. Well, and that's where I'm at. I don't have rig control on either one of mine. Um, so what I do is I set the frequency before I click go. Exactly. The, the frequency where it says dial frequency. Exactly. Set yeah. the radio to that and you should be good to go. Now, yeah, I believe fact, if you uh, if you go into the settings option on the menu bar and click on your radio selection, so go up to the top, go to radio setup, you should be able to pick your radio that you have that you want to use. And this has enough intelligence in it to properly select and control your radio without having to have something like the rig control software separately. And, and I do see FT100 on that list. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, down, 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 down. No, I know I saw that one. I was looking at the ICOMs. The FT100. Uh, oh, okay. Of course, they they have like an ICOM generic that would probably work. The 756 uh, Pro. Oh, yes and no, because I found that with my FTDX1200 Yezu, what works for me is the FTDX2000 setting. So it's close, it's close enough, 
but I don't care if it's closer or, or accurate as long as it works. So it's just you find the one that works out of that list for you. And uh, because my rig is not listed on that drop down menu for, for my big rig back at home. So I use the FT2000 at the bottom of that list and it works for the 1200 wonderfully. Hmm. Play, right. experiment, and have fun, man. Play, experiment, oh, and have yeah. fun. That's what this is all about, right? Yeah, there's a there's a little frustration in there somewhere, too, but that's okay. Hey, that's why we're all here. That's why we have TechNet on Friday night, right? There you go. There you go. Oh, we're, we're, Does this... we're actually going to do a WinLink night. Um, we're, I'm waiting. Uh, Steve needed a few more weeks. He wants to get the Raspberry Pi stuff all worked out really good, and we're going to roll it all up into one big night. Um. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm very much interested in both, both the local and the, and the not local wind link, um, for various reasons, but anyway, all right. Uh, does anybody have anything else on this? Do we want to go over? Cause like I said, I'm going to try that. I'm literally going to, this is my pro one of my two projects this weekend. The other one involves me straightening things up and cleaning. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, um, and I've never tried, uh, one link on HF yet. Do you use uh, the upper, and well, this would be the upper side band or lower side band. Would you use that also with the one link HF? HF is upper side band only. Okay. okay. Regardless of the band, regardless of what band you are, it, it's all upper side band for 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 this win link. Now, right, I yeah, for all the. Uh, for all the digital stuff, it's upper sideband only. So if your if your rig doesn't automatically switch over to upper sideband, um, just you know push the button on the faceplate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I know that uh, FT8, and I think just about all, if not all, the digital stuff is upper sideband, like you said. So um, I actually, I, I'm going to admit it as a newbie, I didn't realize that, and. I kept saying something's wrong on my radio. Something's wrong because at night nightfall comes and I get nothing on 40 and 80. I hear it all on there, but my radio, I don't hear it. You know, nothing comes through. I, it doesn't decode anything. And I fought it for a couple of weeks until I finally realized and I, I was just working FT8 during the day. Cause I, cause my 20 worked fine. My 17. Um, it's just set to upper side I realized I had to set everything to upper sideband and that, that fixed my problem. I even was I was even Googling why are people doing what sounds like FT8 on a frequency that's one and a half megahertz higher than <laughs> God, I'm an idiot. Anyway, uh yeah. I'm new. Did I tell you guys that? Hey yeah. if you're using your 756 Pro and you're going into the back of your transceiver, then you need to push it on your single side key and hold it in long enough for a D to appear. That's digital single sideband. And that takes the audio input through the back jack. If you don't have that selected, it'll key the transmitter and transmit nothing. Really? That's the right. first I've heard that. And now your that, mic will be hot. Yeah, your mic will be hot, yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, yeah, what I'm doing right now with mine is uh, I've, um, uh, Tom Mui gave me a uh, MFJ, one of those uh, 1279s that you plug your plugs into your mic hole and then you plug your mic into that. And it just basically gives you that audio feed without the five volts of deadly voltage that comes through there. Not deadly to us, but deadly to anything that you plug into it. Um, so I use that on, on the, uh, on that, but you know, eventually my goal is to get rig control on both of them because I'm really into remote operation. You know, when I can get through a meeting at work doing FT8, that's a godsend, man. And it's a lot easier to do FT8 than try to watch a movie or something. Uh, so I just was letting you know, I literally, I got this tablet, I got a nice tablet and I, I use team viewer on it and I got a little stylus and I'll sit there and work FT8 on it. And you know, uh, it works really cool. Um, if you guys haven't tried that, you know, you don't, as long as you can do it from your desktop, you can do it from anywhere. Just use team viewer. It's amazing. And it's free. Oops. Somebody's coming in. Hey, let's take a minute. Uh, let's take a break for a second and ask, uh, since we've got new folks coming in, uh, let me go ahead and turn this screen capture off. If I can find the bar. It moves around every time I do something, it's, it moves around. Uh, let's, uh, 
let's take a minute to ask, is there any of the newer folks in that we've, uh, uh, that I've talked to here in the last uh, week or two about uh, ham radio from the last couple of testing uh, sessions? I thought I might've had a few new folks in tonight. Is there anybody in? All right, is there anybody new to the net tonight that wants to introduce yourself? All right, let's talk about antennas or something. Um, I just well, I, I just thought, you know, maybe uh, a couple of these guys, I'm trying to get them to come in. I've been working, as you guys know, I've been, I've been going to the testing and I've been talking to them when they come out like a recruiter, basically. I feel like a military recruiter. Hey, man, have you ever thought about serving your country? You know, um, and... <laughs> <laughs> but uh i i have had some interested people in, so i'm hoping hoping to get them involved i'm going to be eventually asking we're not doing it right yet but i'm going to be eventually asking for people that wants to join me as recruiters for the for the club because i'm going to need like two or three more people to help me all right uh let's see here let me get rid of that what else, what else you want to talk about? Let's open it back up for any other topic. Were we done with WinLink? Is there anything else you want to talk about with WinLink? Somebody popped a message up about FT80 and look at your messages and see if you can respond to him. Oh, okay. I don't know where that's at. <laughs> you guys, I got four screens and it's like everything flies all over the place. You cannot minimize this screen while you... He wanted to know how to call a specific grid square with grid tracker. And he put in an example, uh, you know, he says, is it this? And he's got a, an example there. So he wants to know if that's, if that's correct. Yeah, I'm trying to find it. It says I'm in chat. It says start chatting by, by clicking the left panel. I have no idea. Okay. Um, as far as FTA goes, is how do you call a specific grid square? I do not know. The only way uh, that I know you can call a specific area is like you can call uh, CQDX, obviously. You just, what you do is you go into the FT8 program and you change your, uh, basically your uh, prefix or whatever you want to call it, your uh, preamble. Uh, so that it uh, uh, it says that on it. And uh, here, I'll show you here. I'll pull it up real quick and we can talk about FT8 from it. By the way, FT8's become such a rage. Um, I don't, I, it's, it's almost nuts to me how many people are using it now. Every day there's more people on it. Um, and it's not, it's nothing new. It's not, <laughs> it's nothing new. All right, let me turn the screen capture back on here. And uh, there we go. All right, there's your FT8 screen. Now, see down here, uh, you can uh, you generate your standard messages. Um, down here where it says CQ, you would put like CQ DX. And then every time it goes out, people are know if you're in Florida and some guy's in Georgia, he's probably will pass because he sees that you're looking for something further away. I've also seen people do... Um, CQ US, like if, if it's somebody in Europe, I've seen a lot of people in Europe will say CQ US like that, and you'll see that come in. I jump right on those because they're looking for you. Um, I've also, I'm trying to think what other ones I've seen there. Uh, continents too. I've seen uh, NA and AF for Africa and stuff like that. I've seen those in there too. So that's the only thing I know of on how you call specific people on FT8. Other than that, it really isn't any more specific than that unless you want to call CQ, you know, unless you want to actually pounce on people and pounce on the people you need, which is what I do a lot of times. I spend probably 80% of my time um, scanning and pouncing and about 20% of my time calling CQ. CQ is something I do when I need to click it because I, I got to answer the phone real quick or something. Um, I'm normally working FT8. I'm not, I'm not a, an appliance user. I actually go on there and I move that. I found something the other day, I kept trying to get this station in Japan and I kept trying and trying and trying and he, he just couldn't hear me. 
and he, he heard me once, but he couldn't hear me a second time. So what I ended up doing was uh, I went ahead and uh, I kept moving my thing around. So I went online and looked it up. And you know what it is? Here's the thing. You look and you've got a perfectly clear spot there to transmit in. And you find a really clear spot so you can try to hail that guy across the ocean, right? But what you don't realize is some guy on the other side of him and, uh, you know, in Malaysia or somewhere is, is he's, you know, fragging it all up on that end. And, um, and it, and it, and it's cutting you out. So you just, you need to keep shifting. If you're trying to get that far away contact, every time it comes back up, shift to a new, look down at the last line that you have for that time slot and keep picking clear spots and keep trying and trying and trying using different spots that were clear a few minutes ago when you, you know, the last time your radio saw that time slot. I don't, I, I know I'm getting a little in the weeds. Some of you guys are like, Oh, I don't do this crap. But uh, anyway, that's something I learned the other day and I've been getting some really long distance contacts. I'm, I've been getting contacts over 10,000 miles going over the top around the bottom it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool on grid tracker when you're talking to somebody on the other side of the world, cause the line just goes straight up and then you got to zoom back out to see where the line comes back down again. It reminds me of that map in war games. You guys remember that? Shall we play a game? You guys remember that? Matthew Broadwick. Global thermonuclear war. There you go. There you go. Dr. Falcon. Dr. Falcon. Yes. Um, what was the, uh, Joshua was the name of the, the name of the son that ended up being the password into the computer. That's a great movie. Kind of. Um, but anyway, that's what it, every time I see the, the grid tracker and all those lines going back and forth from Russia and the United States, it brings back that movie. I'm like, where's Matthew Broderick right now? Anyway. All right. Uh, probably in a halfway house. Probably. So is it, um, did somebody get them? I did. Thank you. All Very right. good, Dave. All right. So other than that, I'm going to bring that back and uh, we'll stop that capture there. Let's uh, uh, what's the, I don't, was there something else on FT8 that I could answer? Just, just come on in. Okay. Let's move on. Let's open it up to anybody out there that has any tech related question or any question about the club, the group, what we do, anything like that. Let's let's open it up for anything that uh, that you guys would like to discuss uh, other than religion, politics, and money. How about antennas? Go say, man, we got the talkers in here tonight. Uh, yeah, what what antennas you want to talk? I can talk antenna. We could do we could do the Friday night antenna show if you want. Midnight talking about antennas. All right. So I, know, I know. And, and antennas <laughs> is the Pandora box. Uh, earlier, earlier this week uh, on the uh, Southwest Florida traffic net, uh, Headley had had called in with with uh, a couple of questions about an antenna mount. And a after the net, uh, he had talked to uh, KE4CB Butch um, about mounting an antenna. And one of the things I I'd listened in and. I, I jumped in and I think I saved Headley's life because he was trying to mount an antenna to the galvanized pipe of the electrical weather head that comes in from the pole to his house. So just guys, remember your your basic technician class license, I think it is probably pre-printed on every exam across the country. Don't ever mount an antenna where it can fall onto an electric line. And Headley was trying to mount it right to the weather head that was coming out of his electric meter pan and going up the wire to the pole. So we, we were able to steer him away from that. Just, just remember antenna safety guys, antenna safety. Wow. Hopefully yeah. we saved his life. I heard him on the radio today on the traffic net. So he's still alive. So that's a plus. <laughs> I, I got to meet. Uh, Not for Eddie lack of trying. Yeah, really. yeah. Yeah. I got to meet him a couple weeks ago. He's a nice guy. We were yeah, he's a great guy. He should be over at uh, Swap Shop tomorrow, too, if you want to have a chat with him. So pop on out. Hey, I'm by the way, I'm Swap Shop tomorrow opens up at 1030. Everybody come on out. Yeah, I've got a bunch of rookies. Hopefully we'll show up out there, too, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, you were, you were there two weeks ago. You brought a rookie with you. That was nice to see. 
Yeah, actually, uh, he was an unlicensed person that showed up. He saw it on the internet, and um, I brought him all around, gave him the pamphlets and the, and the nickel tour, and brought him inside and showed him all of our junk. And well, uh, and he was very interested. He he's studying. I've been in contact with him. We're back and forth on emails. He's got questions. He's studying for his tech. So well, well you know what? I mean, uh, it, there there are a lot of hams out there that. Uh, look down on citizen band but i'm sure we've all experienced it that's where i got my first start with it was back in the 70s was on the you know the old the chicken band as they call it and uh sort of sort of lit that fire and they, they have cbs and power supplies for sale and a couple of cheap antennas over there at least get up and get on the air because a, in an emergency a cb might save your life yeah it may and that's you know that's a band other than, i i don't know God, I'm going to play. Here we go. I'm the new guy. Ugh. I think my radios will do, um, what is it, 19 meters uh, AM, right? No, it's 11 meters oh, AM, and your radio should, should not be able to do it. I shouldn't be able to do it. Okay. Without right, because it's not type radio. approved. Er, type approved. No, I, I know I know. type approved, but when someone's <laughs> life is in danger, type approved goes right out the window because you got to save someone's life. Well, that's true, yeah. Um, it, it may receive there and not transmit it. That's probably what it is, John, because I never tried to talk on it there. I just, I, I thought I scanned through there. I looked up where it was one time and scanned through it. But. Right, yes, John, you are correct, because I know my 1200 DX will receive 11 meters. And I actually use that to test and tune my antenna on the truck before the trip down here. Oh, and let me tell you something else. To, oh, Steve, did you have something? Um, go yeah, ahead, I, Steve, oh, if you had something. Sorry about that. I'm going to leave the net, uh, if that's all right. That's perfectly fine, brother. Have a good night. We'll talk okay, to you good next night, time. Good night, everybody. All right, we'll see you next week. Good night, Steve. Good night, Steve. Later, Steve. Good night, John boy. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up was something I learned last week that I heard on the Sunshine Net about a week and a half ago. We were talking about the AM. There was an AM contest. Um, and we were talking about AM. And they kept talking about how you should not broadcast or transmit on um, AM at 100% power a lot. It's really bad on your finals. And I was just wanting to put that out there to see if anybody else wanted to comment on that. Because yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. That's kind of important. <laughs> yeah, on, on the modern rigs, and actually they, they reduce power. Uh, it'll, it'll only put out about 50 watts on AM on my, uh, my ICOMs. Um, it automatically reduces power for that because AM single is 100% duty cycle. Right. And, and if you modulate 100% uh, modulation, then just multiply that times four. So that 50 watts that you're putting out is, is actually going to be four, um, 200 watts uh, peak to peak. Yeah, I could see why that would create heat pretty quick. Yeah, so anyway, the, the, and the modern rigs reduce power in that mode because it's 100% duty cycle. That's the same thing with your PSK signal, PSK31. Uh, but that's also a courtesy not to go over 30, 40 watts because you'll blank the screen out on everybody else if you put 100 watts of PSK signal out. No, FM for that matter. If your HF rig has FM capability for 10 meters, so you're going to have to go back down in power. 100% duty, so same deal. All right. Well, I'm, I just wanted to put that out there because that might be something somebody didn't know. Um, check your radio and make sure it powers itself down to about 50% for AM, just so you don't bang out your finals. Um, See all that stuff behind me? Yeah. That's all AM transmitting equipment. It's all uh, old boat anchors and, and it's built to run the 100% duty cycle. There you go. All we need now is uh, a couple of turntables, a little antenna, and a, an FCC license for a... Uh, so for a that's radio. why Florida is so hot. Dave is running all that equipment and generating all the heat down here. <laughs> it's pretty bad on a cold morning. I just come out to the shack and turn everything on about an hour before I come out here. That's all I have to do. Yellow watt uh, transmitter in the other room. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, one quick question. Uh, is there anybody of you guys or know anybody who's the specialist in the club on grounding? I've got a new guy that's got questions about grounding his rig. And I'd like to, I'd like to give him to somebody that would, uh, that would know a lot about that. Well, get that ARRL book on bound, bonding and grounding. That would be one thing that you could do. Right, I know, but my job is as uh, the recruiter guy or the uh, what do they call me? The uh, advocate is to try to connect people with specialists. So yeah. I was just putting it out there because I don't know who our specialist on grounding and cad welding would be. I don't know. So I just was putting it out there. If anybody is a, is good on that and knows a lot about it, let me just send me an email or let me know on here. And I'll just shoot you his email so you guys can email back and forth. He's a new guy. Um, I'm trying very hard to get these people every answer they need and, and get them in contact with the right people right away. Um, so, like I said, if anybody knows anybody, let me know. If anybody has a, a cheap used car, let me know. All yeah, right. It's Larry Zimmer, but uh, maybe it's Tom Muey now. He might know something about it. But I know Larry Zimmer, he, he, he had a couple of courses on grounding your equipment that he showed he he did presentations at the ham club meeting tom yeah tom muey too uh, i get that several people have suggested tom muey okay yeah i'll uh, i'll just get in contact with one of those guys and see if they mind if if i put I this guy in contact what i do for a ground i have several ground stakes several grounding rods i think i've got mm -hmm. about five or six of them and you want to make sure that you grant, you know, you grant, you make up, you use eight foot rods and you use like number six. I use number four wire and you connect them all up and you make sure that they're hooked to the utility ground, your telephone ground, your, if you have it, cable TV ground, get them all bonded together. Uh, then when you run your stuff, when you run your cables through the uh, window or whatever, you make sure they're all grounded at that point and grounded together. Uh, that keeps uh, when you have nearby lightning strikes, you don't get uh, you don't get uh, changes in potential across your house. It, that keeps it all the same. That's the big thing. So, so you're grounding it all at one point right outside the house. Right. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, it provides a larger path of dissipation. Uh, when when you when you bond all those different items together and take them to a single point source going into the ground or multiple point sources but all daisy chains together you you are basically spreading out that that lightning strike load that that ground load across a larger area so that you won't get a spike back up into your equipment right but you want to make sure that everything's bonded right. together all right utility ground and your telephone ground if you have it your i know most people don't have landline phones anymore but a lot of people like me draw their internet through the telephone line so that's how do i ground my telephone i don't understand well not that phone <laughs> that's a hilarious hey john bring bring that tomorrow to the to the uh, swap shop and i'll bring my welder and i'll show you how to ground it <laughs> I want to see you drive an eight foot ground stake through that. I don't know. That'll ground that, it. That would ground it. Yeah. yeah I, the grounding is something I have to admit that I'm, I'm behind the times on. I have run, um, I've got a, a, an eight gauge copper wire that I've got going through my, you know, around my tuner and around my two radios and ground several other things here. And then it goes right outside and grounds to my FPNL ground. That's all I have right now. And, uh, my shack, I put the electrical in, in the shack and it's all grounded really well too. But <clears throat> I need to put some of my own grounding equipment in and I also need to go around the corner and get the cable ground. I'm uh, yeah. something. I'll be right back. Hey, re just remember right now, wire is a lot cheaper than radios because radios you can't get. Everybody is looking at from everything I've seen on all the different websites for radio shipment dates, they're talking end of April to mid or I'm, yeah, end of March to mid April. But if you want to try to buy a radio, there's nothing out there because of that semiconductor fire over in China, which I think is a bunch of bull, but it's just a way to control our communications. <laughs> 
well, thank God we've got a bunch of them in a storage room. We're, yeah, we're, uh, there's not even anything out there on Craigslist. Uh, there used to be a very robust listing of equipment for ham radio and amateur radio out on Craigslist. It's all vanished. It is all gone. Everybody found out and they're holding on to it. Yeah, I haven't checked Facebook Marketplace yet because everybody tells me everybody's leaving Craigslist to go to Facebook Marketplace. I don't know. Why. Oh, I refuse to have Facebook. I yeah, have well, no uh, social media accounts whatsoever. And I've been a tech guy for 25 years and I, I refuse to sign on to that stuff. I, uh, yeah, I canceled my Twitter account just a while back uh, when all that happened. But uh, I still I have to keep my Facebook because I have clients that I have to access their website on. I, yeah, I never go. had anything to cancel. Yep. All right. What's that, Rick? This is a common point ground plane. This is a uh, what this guy is, is actually a copper. It's tin plated, a copper plate. I bought it from an outfit called Georgia Copper. They're up in Cleveland, Georgia. And you can get these with up to 20 uh, holes in them. Now this one I'm not gonna use again. I've got, uh, I got one with 10 holes in it. And you, what you do is you put these bulkheads on there and you'll also take a polyphaser lightning arrester uh, for each one. But you run, run all your cables through this and then you see this ground this is what you hook your ground rod into. You know, this comes extra. I brought this at Home Depot. But the idea is, and I put this outside, uh, the idea is all of the cables that come into your house are all grounded at the same place. So this gets rid of any potential difference. And of course, then if you look in the, uh, look in the ARR handbook, there's some articles in there on how to ground your equipment and everything. So, but you, the point, the bottom line is you want everything hooked to a common point someplace. Right. The, um, the pass-throughs that MFJ sells, uh, Rick, if you'd hold that piece back up again, please. Um, it's basically the same thing that it, it's two stainless steel plates, one on the inside and one on the outside. And MFJ makes it out of a piece of wood. I chose to use PVC for mine just because it's more weather resistant. But he's right. As you bolt those bulkheads through, the the clamping force provides that negative post external ring. And you can then connect that ground wire from that plate to a ground rod outside your house. And that gives you the common point of grounding for all your radios, for all your antennas, uh, so that you get the dissipation effect. Yeah, actually, I've got five ground rods all hooked together with uh, uh, copper number four, four gauge wire, which is what the Florida Power and Light uses for their grounds. And then I'm going to I'm going to probably put in three or four more. But uh, once I have all this system, I had one over at the other place I had here and uh, never had any problems. It uh, provides a good ground and uh I think it helps reduce the noise. I use NFED half wave antennas and I've been very happy with it in terms of how, what effect it has on, uh, you know, rounding everything. But this, the, the big idea is you want to have all, all of your antennas go through one place and you get them all grounded there. Yeah, and that common plate going through the pass through, through the window does exactly that for you. Thing, yeah. It's a different idea, but. I like this a little better because that puts that common point ground plane outside. So rather than like making it like part of the, the, the actual partition between inside and outside, yeah. the wire, the wires should actually exit the structure and then go into that ground block, which is suspended structure. outside the structure. Yeah, I like okay. this better. Now some other people yeah. have different preference, but this is the way I like to do it. Right. Yeah. For, for me, I prefer the, you know, the window pass through with that, with that common plate on the inside and outside of that piece of piece of block board. And, you know, when I know there's a big ass storm coming, I just disconnect it from the inside of the window. I just pull all my antennas off my radios at, at the window point. And if it strikes the antennas, all right, I lose an antenna, but I don't lose a $1,200 rig. So you know, antennas are cheap compared to that. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And all this, and it gives us an excuse to build a new one. Right. Go ahead, John. In all this discussion, there's one point that needs to be made. A lightning hits more times than not will come in on your power, not on your antenna. So 
when you disconnect your antenna from your rig, you're only doing half the job. Disconnect the power supply too. Uh, Correct. In, anybody that's ever worked in a radio shop and seen lightning lightning damaged radios come in will tell you that more than half of them got it on the power feeds and not on the antenna feed. John brings up a very good point. Um, yeah, when you know there's a big storm coming, disconnect your antennas and, and pull the pull your power plugs out of the wall. I had a friend of mine, a lifelong friend I've known for probably 49 years now, that had a lightning strike in his yard, and the strike traveled through the dirt, up his downspouts, and electrified his house, and took out most of the electronics in his house and he wasn't a radio guy but it took out some very expensive and very rare old tube amplifier guitar ramps hmm. it, it was it was a ground strike near his house and it actually blew yeah probably a two or three inch trench in the dirt as it ran towards his house and hit hit the water pipes the downspouts that's another reason to separate your downspouts with a piece of pvc where it comes off the east trough before it hits the down downward line yep i've already had that happen and that's when i learned that it just being plugged in it doesn't even have to be on and it'll get it yeah you got that right hey can i tell you if you're wiring your shack when i wired my shack i did something a little odd um i went into a switch box a four gang and the first two gangs are all the plugs that for my radios and basically the hot and the common both go through switches. And when I'm done in here, I hit those and all of my radios, both the hot and the common are disconnected from the lightning board. does not respect switches though. I understand that it will jump a switch. I understand that, but I'm, it's a protection that I use every day. When I'm yeah, not it's in. better than nothing, no doubt. And, it, and and it's better than nothing. It, it isolates my equipment every day when I'm not in here. When lightning comes and it's really heavy, I, I pull the antenna cords. And like you said, when it gets bad, I pull the power cords off the power supplies too. I got three power supplies and about five antenna cables. It only takes a minute to pull that stuff. I'm slowly, I was slowly getting the quick connects for my, uh, I got two of them so far for my coaxes, those quick connectors. Yeah. I don't really, I don't really like them that much because I'm always worried they're not going to be the best connection. But they seem to work fine, and I they think they are the best connection. I really? use B and C because the only reason I'm thinking I, I just want to make sure uh, that I've got a good connection. But when I use these push-ons, um, I figure it's a lot less wear and tear on the equipment because I'm not screwing something on and unscrewing something. I, it just slides right on and it pulls that, right that's on. That's the, the idea with the power poles is you have two wide surfaces that are sliding together. Right. Yeah. Rather than something momentarily, you've got two solid surface, surfaces. Right. That are on. And, and that's, the, that's the beauty of power poles. Yeah. 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 All right, guys, here's one for you. Okay. I've, I've been designing in my head an actuator driven uh system that would unplug all of my coaxes you know they would be the plug-in ones where it would actuate and unplug and then i wanted to make a system where after it unplugged this piece over here which would be the antennas would flip up and then it could plug into grounds is that would that be a good system or not? That would be just like unplugging your antennas and plugging them into a ground. I, I, I saw on one of the websites, some people sell a, a, a thing that does that, a switch that, that you, you turn it and it goes to ground. I, you know what I'm saying? It well, either I, goes I to feed or to ground. Go to ground. I've seen where they just unplug. Right. But I wanted to be able to unplug. In other words, it would retract, flip up, and then plug back in and that would all be grounded. And then it would go through the cycle again. And this time it would pull it back down and go right back into the antenna. So it'd just be like a push to connect and a push to unconnect. Right. But I just wonder unplugging them and putting them straight to ground, that center conductor and everything, would that be a better way to go or just let it alone, unplugged? It depends on how good an engineer you are at building something like that, Steve. 
Well, yeah, I'm yeah. I, I would say a, just a full, full up disconnect is the best way. You know, no connection. It can't get uh, corrupted. Well, eh, that's what I asked Comcast, and they couldn't come up with an answer for that. But well, okay. Well, then if I just fully unplug it, I could have like a ten inch or twelve inch act inch actuator, you know, to get it far away. You know, sure. Yeah. It's just, you don't get an arc. Right. Yeah. You know, hey, disconnected is always better or, or, you know, so we think. Okay. That would be cool. I would love to have I... ambulance and fire truck days. We had power disconnectors where we would have the an ambulance plugged in to run, you know, heaters for fluids or, or glow plugs for the engine or, or any number of things. And there were mechanic. some of them had mechanical actuators that when you turned on the batteries on the vehicle, it would pop the plugs out automatically, mechanically. Yep. Yeah. So you we, could- We had something. those. Yeah, that's what, that's what sort of, we sort of had that up at the Port Authority when I was working in the subway tunnels for, for New York and New Jersey is the, the big heavy switch gear for energizing that third rail when we were down in the tunnels working um they would have to you know throw throw the breakers basically to, to de-energize that third rail and it was you know like like you described it was a big arm that came out and it just broke those connectors and held on to it and kept it in position away so that there was no power in that third rail yeah there you go And that had enough amps to push a train. Think about That's that. Crazy. There's only 480 volts, but enough amp to, enough amps to push a loaded commuter train at rush hour. As they say, it's the amps that kills you. Well, what was it 180 volts? 480 volts. 480. Okay, yeah. Yeah, give or take. Oh yeah. Yeah, I have 480. Uh, it wasn't bad. I mean, you know, th th I wasn't worried about the voltage or the amps. What really concerned me down in the train tunnels was the rats that were the size of German shepherds. I wonder. How I, used to carry, I used to carry a pistol when I was working in Manhattan. I was risking three to five years going to jail, but I figured I was going to go to jail alive instead of being et by a rat. My God, the rats are so big that you'll risk three to five to defend yourself against them. Literally the size of a German shepherd under the Hudson River. Yes. I'm not going to that city. I'm going to mark that one off right now. Let me mark that off. Okay, that been off. there, done that. Yep. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, so what's next? Anything? Equipment, guys, make sure you have spares for your gear. Test it out regularly. You know what? That go box that you have sitting on the closet shelf that you think is going to work, hook up to it, take it out in the field, plug it into your truck, go out and do the, the traffic net on hey, you know, weekday mornings and try it out. Off. I do every week. Well, oh, yeah. I, I see down here where capacitors can go all the time just from the heat down here. It's the dampness, it's the humidity. Yeah, I always keep my shed under air. I'm like, I keep it nice and dry in here. What did you say, something, John? I was just telling Leo my go box worked the last time I tried it. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were all on the Aries net on Wednesday night with the, with the bad mic last week or the bad range. Um, and I know Steve let it go to see how we could all handle a, a uh, less than perfect situation. And we got through it, but you know what guys, you know, take your gear out once a week. I, I do traffic net Monday or Tuesdays from, you know, down at a remote park just to get the gear out just to fire up the radio and get the box opened up and throw an antenna stick up in the air and make sure it all works. And if it doesn't, I got time to fix it before I need it and make sure you have spares. So if you got a cable, have a second cable. If you got a radio, have a second radio, same with the antennas, same with the power supplies, you know, have a, a solar with a battery or something you can run off of your truck. Just uh, get out there and use it. You know, uh, you know, we all, Hey, the, uh, the, uh, I guess the stereotype of this hobby is, you know, 
bunch of us old guys just sitting around in our radio shacks, never getting outdoors, right? Well, hey, winter field day was a perfect example. We all got to get out there and exercise our gear. Um, uh, do it once a week. Take it out. Go have fun. You know, go enjoy the sunshine for a couple hours in the morning. And boy, winter field day was fun. Oh, God, yeah, it was a blast. Uh, I told John that was the only reason I came down here initially. We just moved into a new house on Election Day in November, and I wasn't really thinking about coming down here, but I said, I got to go down there and cook for these guys. Well, I've already decided I, this year um, I'm going to run two I'm gonna run two rigs overnight. I'm going to do FT8 and phone. I can easily do that at the same time, and you can do that for summer. Summer, I think you can do FT8. Um. I could easily do FT8 and phone. How hard's that? So during the day, there's there's more than enough people to work the bands. You know, I, I don't even need to work all the time in the daytime. But the nighttime, there's only four of us, which means we can run seven radios, which means three of us could run two radios. No, you bring up a good point is that you don't have to be there for the 24 hours. And if you want to do something that specializes or takes advantage of the nighttime conditions. Come on out. Hey, I'll provide for you, food for you overnight. I did this year. There you go. And uh, hot John, meals. John, I'm going to cue John because this is where he reminds me that summer and winter field day are not competitions. <laughs> <laughs> I become a little obsessed with the points, I guess. They are oh, right. Yeah, we don't keep score. Everybody wins. We all get a trophy, right? <laughs> I had a good time. That's all accounts. We had a good time. I mean, that's that's what it's for. And we made a lot of good contacts. The only if I if you ask me, get tell me one disappointing thing about winter field day. You know what it is? And and it's this is stupid, but the one disappointing thing about field day is that I don't get credit for all those great contacts that I made. They don't go into my logbook. I know that sounds crazy, but it's like, oh, man, I had a lot of great phone contacts. <laughs> You'll make them up. Uh, I, well, on phone, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, we, should have like a, we should have like an international calling hour every day where like we all come on at the same time once a day. Maybe we can find each other out there. Well, I mean, if you just do a Google search on ham radio contest, the, the first thing that comes up is a is a weekly eight day calendar of all the the ham contests that are going on, and it shows you who's running what for how long and what modes and what bands, et cetera. So you know, it's, that's an easy way if you want to jump and on there and make some contacts. Every weekend, there, there, there's something running out there almost every weekend. You're absolutely right. Oh, what the hell is this thing doing? Yeah, that well, yeah, that's my other question is what the heck is that website doing to us? Because I have found that it, when you sign into the members only area and you log in, right, and you're logged in and you're looking at that members only page, God help you if you go and click on a link on our web page, like for the traffic net, and you go to quote a non members area, it logs you out. And when you try to go back to where you were, you have to sign back in again. Uh oh. It doesn't hold your cookie. Even though you check that box, it says, remember me for this session. It doesn't remember you for a page. Well, I thought they went through one of the meetings here recently and said something about the web page not using cookies. There was a big discussion about that. I forget. The yeah, but yeah, now well, I, got, I keep getting pops up on there that says, do you accept our cookie policy? And there's a little bar at the bottom with an X. And I said, yeah, click it. All right, so it looks like, I don't know if you guys can see this, it looks like uh, the big contest this weekend is the CQ 160 meter contest. Yeah, I'll have to pass on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a big antenna down here. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to talk to three neighbors to put that up. Uh, I'd have to call my out. brother and have him send my gear down from Pennsylvania. I was going to say 160 meters, that's almost halfway to work. All right, let's see. Um, the next one is... Do what? The sprints are fun. Yeah, I it haven't tried like one of those yet. Over, yeah, if, if you have a voice key or the sprints are fun, otherwise you go horse after the first hour. Yeah, well, this is the, this is today, this first column. So the sprints, that sprint's already over. Uh, but this one's getting ready to start. Um, this is tomorrow and then Saturday, uh, Sunday. 
I like this presentation here. That's why I put this one on our on the TechNet website. Hey, Ian, because... you got an FT, you got an FT FTN network going up there tomorrow, um, later today. So that's I think an FT four. This one here, FDN DX contest. Yes, yeah, you got our 80, 40, 80 through 10. You were running an FT4 mode. Yeah, that's not bad on five watts. Yeah. You might, oh, you might. man. That sounds like yeah, fun. Yeah, I think I know what Ian's doing tomorrow. Oh, man. I love FT4. You know why? Because, you know, FT8, remember I told you guys FT8's wham bam. Thank you, Ham. FT4, FT4. FT4's wham bam. Thank you, Ham. <laughs> <laughs> it's ft8 on speed yes it is it's ft8 on crack yeah it, i'm telling you guys uh ft4 is great because if you, if you guys haven't used it uh ft4 works in half the time interval that ft8 works in so instead of 15 seconds up and 15 seconds down it's 7.5 and 7.5 and uh i like it because when the frequencies are good it works good. Unfortunately, I find that sometimes I, I can't make contacts on it that well on certain bands at certain times because it does require, I think, slightly better propagation than FT8 does. I could be wrong. Somebody wants to tell me about that. Because it, it happens quicker, so I would assume it probably is not as reliable over distance, but I don't know. Okay, and back to you, Bill. Um, anyway, let's to see the here. studio. Um, yeah, back to the studio. Uh, let's see. Uh, single op, multi op, low power, 100 watts. That's me, barefoot, 100 watts. Uh, the only, the only pamphlet, the only big power amplifier I've ever seen was on the computer screen. Uh, let's see here. QSO points, one per point. I like the biggest amp I ever had was for my CB radio at 180 watts. You know, I had a 100 watt kicker for my CB radio. Um, I way back many, many years ago, I was probably breaking some laws, breaking the law, breaking the law. All right, let's see here. Probably. I was back in the 80s. Yeah. I didn't see any yellow vans going by, but uh, you never know. Uh, those of you who know me, no, I have several times made the comment that I have never run an amplifier on ham radio. Right, neither have I. Um, nothing else said. I, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Right, I've never run one on ham radio, and I can say that too. And you know, honestly, we've got the crappiest conditions ever, and I can talk around the world all night on forty or eighty right now. Um, I don't see why I need to put a big old 1500 watt kicker on it. I don't see why I, I just don't, I don't expect now I, digital modes, especially I don't, but even for voice, um, because here's what I don't understand. And, and, and someone can speak to this if you'd like, um, your radio is only good as far as it can receive. And if a guy can barely hear me and I can barely hear him and we're both putting out a hundred Watts. That's about right. That's, that's, that's what's normal. That's nominal. 1500 Watts isn't going to make you hear him any better. That's my point, John, a 1500 Watts gets him around the world twice. Okay. He's skipping everywhere, but the point is he's not hearing any of us. And, and all he's doing is taking up a lot of bandwidth. I just, I almost don't see the purpose for doing that. We used to call those alligator radios, big mouth, little tail. <laughs> antenna, antenna, antenna. Absolutely. Yep. Antenna, antenna, antenna. That's right. It all gets back to triple A. Yep. Yep. Well, I've actually worked Pennsylvania and uh, I believe it's New York during a contest on, on 80 meters with five watts. This is voice, not CW. Wow. Yeah, I was, uh, where was I? Was I New Hampshire or PA? I can't remember which one of the two QTHs I was at earlier this year um, that I got somebody. I Oh, I got, um, um, oh, God, I, his name is on the tip of my tongue. Got him down here on 75 watts from up, up in the northeast on a long wire antenna. Sweet work. 
I watch. Hey, somebody's playing my song. <laughs> uh, let's see here. North American yeah, QSO party. That's RTTY. R R T T Y. That's um I haven't used that yet. That's kind of the digital mode that's built into the HF radios, I guess. Um right, but it works. Is it cool? Is it is it worth getting into? Yeah. If yeah, it's uh it's a five level code instead of ASCII, but uh it's a different code, but it works. Mm. Now, you, it's like every other digital mode. You don't turn up your power very high. Right. Yeah, I've been running my FT8 at about 60 watts. And everybody's like, oh, my God, that seems high. I mean, it yeah. does. It does. But it, my wire is. is not my wire is not optimum place. It's not an optimum setup. It's got my big tower going right up between the V and it's just, it, everything's wrong. There's branches all over the entire thing. It's underneath a canopy of branches and leaves. And so I'm fighting to get out. Yeah. When I go down below 50, no one hears me. No one. I, and, I'm, and I'm not just saying that. So I try to run at 60 to 80, depending on what I have to run to get out. And, uh, and that's what I have to do. I, I have tried it because my first thing was I was trying that DX and doing, I was trying to do like 10 Watts, you know, I started out at 10 Watts and I kept thinking something was wrong. Something was wrong. What do you and use for an antenna? I've got a, uh, I don't know what the name of it is. It's a long wire. It was given to me by, Tom, by somebody, by Tom Lambie. Yeah. Um, it's just a long wire. Uh, it's the, it with the uh, ladder line that goes out to it. Yeah. Uh, coax hooks into it at some point. I've got a piece of 25 foot piece of low loss coax going out to it. I don't know what kind it is. It's thick coax wire going out to it. And then I got the, uh, you know, it hooks into that. And then it's got the two bolts on either side. They go to the ladder line and then it's got the prescribed length ladder line that goes out to the piece that just splits and goes two different ways. And I've got it isolated really good everywhere. It's, it, it comes with isolators on the end and everything. And uh, I've got it in an inverted V right now that uh, actually my antenna comes up in the middle of the inverted V. Hmm. And part of it's over my house, it, like two feet over the corner of my house. And it's all under canopy. I just, I'm telling you, I'm fighting problems getting out of here. So I have to use wattage to, to, to bully my way out of this neighborhood. Hmm. Kind of like a G5 RV antenna. Yeah. Maybe. I looked at, we talked about that. It, it sounds night. almost like your other antennas are reflecting back your power. Um, having, a, having an overlap in situation from what you just described, you might be some of your output power power might be reflected back off of one of your other wires or your tower and, and tramp it down your own signal. I, I wouldn't rule that out. And, and here's the thing. I've got my tower up and the only way I could come up with a place to put the top of my wire antenna is to run an eight foot standoff off my tower like this. And so right where my Yagis are right here, about four feet below my Yagis is where my, wire antenna starts and then it goes down from there so anytime i'm using the wire antenna the yagi's disconnected and anytime i'm using the yagi's the wire antenna is disconnected because they're about four feet apart up there and i'm just afraid yeah but they're but they're still they're still in close proximity to one another i mean that's right. why we spread out winter field day this year like we did yep. to to get everybody's antennas further apart we took over both sides of that pavilion um, and we still I mean, had they, issues they may be disconnected night. but i gotta i gotta believe that a bunch of your signal is still getting it could be reflected in or drawn in or, you know, by having that amount of metal so close to the end of your wire, um, it's it can't be good. I just it can't, can't be believe good. that that five that antenna we just mentioned a minute ago. I looked at those. I think there's a six too. a six. Um, what is it? A dipole. What do you guys call it? G five RV. D five uh, RV. They think they make a six and a five. And I was looking at those. And uh, I just don't know if it's going to have the same gain that I'm getting with this long wire. 
But then again, if I can get it up above the trees out away from everything or something, maybe it would. Dude, have you tried have you tried a simple vertical for HF? Have you looked at Wolf River coils? Yeah, I would like to try something. I but I I haven't been able to buy a single piece of radio equipment in a long time, so other than Yeah, the, the Wolf River coil stuff, um I know Leo Windler runs um uh, I think he runs their TIA. They're taking along and I have um, their portable vertical. And here in Florida, I stick the thing onto a metal stake in the ground. No ground radials, zero ground radials. Tune it to the band, talking to Venezuela. Pow. Like that. Yeah. I, I, Leo, Leo showed me, he set up his for me one day out at the uh, swap shop. And it's, yep, that's uh, a that's a sweet setup for portable. That thing is marvelous. Uh, it, but his is a bit long. Uh, Leo's is a bit long. Mine is only about twelve foot tall. What's that radio again? What's that radio? What's what's that antenna again? You said the, the antenna is it's made by Wolf River Coils dot com. Whisco Whiskey Oscar Lima Foxtrot. So Wolf River. You know, R I V E R coils, C O I L S dot com. Thank you. Hey, so much. You, there, there you go, you Ian. Want you got it right up on the screen. Go ahead and take a look at this. Uh, go to their products, go to their products page, or I'm sorry, go to the shop page. All right. To your right. To your right. There you go. And scroll down to the portable vertical. There's the take it along. Is that what you said? Scroll down to the portable vertical. That's that's the take along is what Leo has. Oh, okay. Uh, Leo four. Uh, uh, Leo. There it is. It is the portable vertical. Yep. Uh, this this puppy is sweet. I stick it on a ground rod, no ground radials, and I'm talking to Venezuela all day long. Cuba, no sweat. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard. Shoot, I, shoot, I've even hit Eastern Europe with this thing from down here. Wow. Is a collapsible antenna. It puts together like tent poles, okay? Like the aluminum tent poles that we all know from camping as kids, et cetera. Clicks together when it's disassembled. It's no more than a five foot length of three sections. And and uh, what what's the uh, meterage on it? I mean, frequency? Is it 40 meters, 60, 80? Uh, 80 through 10. Oh, 80 through 10. Are you serious? Wow. If you if you watch the video and you look at the, the picture of it, it achieves that by having that wound coil with a sliding collar to adjust the antenna length to make it up in the coil. Holy smokes. Uh, Ian's there's, got there's the, the thing coil. up. So right now he's tightening down the thumb screws on the mounting rod that's in the dirt. He's putting on ground radials right now. I mean, right. Oh, I, I don't need ground radials down here, but then again, I'm also only 20 feet from a saltwater canal here in my backyard, so I'm, I'm you know, I got all the ground plane in the world. Okay, Ian, it, another, it comes. Do you have 130 feet of space? Just about that. Oh, that's really good. I want to tell you about the antenna I'm using. It's called. It's an infed half wave antenna. Again, no radials. Uh, and you, the only thing is you, you want to look at myantennas.com. My antennas. Yeah, myantennas.com. That's the commercial model. I can build one. I mean, it's not anything real. It's a lot less complicated even than this. Yeah, the uh, the NFED half waves. I've got I've got two of those. One forty through ten, and one eighty. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, eighty through ten. Um, and I can tune it up to 160 and I use those up at my house in PA and I can just sling it up into a tree, but you know, I, I got enough property up there where I can shoot a 164 foot wire into a tree and not have an issue and have it almost vertical too, which is the real plus. You can make these things and you can set them up as an inverted V. I don't know. Uh, inverted L. Absolutely. I, I, I try to run mine vertical to get the biggest, you know, vertical stick I can. But you don't need a tuner for these guys. And you can do it. You can go on 80, 40, uh, 20, 15, and 10 uh, with no tuner. And I know I've got I've got mine. I'm running the EFHW 8010P, 
which is the lower power version, it's 200 PEP, uh, never had any problems with it. So, and you got a little coil there, and this is about the stealthiest antenna I think I've ever seen. You cannot see this thing from the street at all. Now, I'm not oh, absolutely. That, that 14 gauge wire, shoot, you can't even see it unless you know it's there. Uh, even 10 foot away, it's hard to pick out. This is my favorite antenna right now because uh, for the amount, and I've talked to people in Slovenia on it, talked to uh, Italy on 40 meters. Uh, like I said, it's also what I used to contact Pennsylvania, and I think it was New York with five watt sideband during a contest. These are good antennas. Yeah, mine was um, the ones I have I got from MFJ, and I had mine when I was at the New Hampshire house. I had it running. Uh, feed point was 10 foot off the ground. What's end that? of the wire was 40 foot off the ground, and I could beat, and I and I mean beat with a, with a billy club, beat up the, the Eastern European countries all day long, get in through any pileup with it on 75 watts. Um they're fantastically cheap, inexpensive. They're easy to build if you got a soldering kit and a little bit of patience. Uh, I just chose to go to Quick Root and, you know, yeah, buy yeah. one. But it was, you know, it was only a hundred bucks or seventy nine bucks, something like that. So it's, you know, it wasn't bad. I have a question. You said no tuner. Yep. Right. So what does it use? Magic. I don't mean. Oh no, I'm the sorry, liquid of wire totally is a, is multi frequency resonant. So that, you're telling me you're telling me that it, there's no there's no because see in my mind what I picture is you told me no tuner so I picture some magical thing inside this box what what's in the box what so well, what's in yeah. the what's in the box is you have a you have a toroid coil with a triple wound wire that. It, and you can look up how to build these things. It literally, they're they're a hell of a lot cheaper to buy the parts and build it yourself if you have the patience, and if you have a steady enough hand, which I don't anymore, to do the soldering connections. But um, you know that's why I paid the eighty bucks for them. But uh, it's it's simple to build. You know the hardest part is getting a, a waterproof box that has ventilation, because it does generate a little bit of heat. I noticed there's there's like a little like a little. Um... Well, it looks like what would stick uh, out of the hood holes, yeah. of a... That's vent yeah. holes, yeah. There's yeah. like a little thing on the side that looks like what used to stick out of the hood of a muscle car. But, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's a... Look up the MFJ 1984 and the 1982s. Um, one's the 80, one's the 40. Um, uh, they're, they're dirt cheap. And when you put them up in the air, uh, I, I've got one right now up in PA that I had mounted... The, the feed point mounted under on the underside of my deck about eight foot off the ground and run up into a tree and standing on the deck looking out i had a hard time finding a wire and i knew where the damn wire was <laughs> yeah i had same deal here so another thing you might want to do is go on youtube and look up a fellow named steve ellington uh i think his call is n4lq he goes and reviews these things and just and yeah Come on. Yeah, and he does all. Okay. He tells you how to build the things and everything else. In addition, that's a, to the that's a pretty keyer there. Yeah, that's, that. that's a. Button. And those are definitely highly polished up, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Those, are, those, are, those are also brand new, too. I, I had a friend of mine give me a World War II training key uh, last winter that I got to take home and polish up. As pretty, as pretty as that is, I'm still not learning it. <laughs> no, that's what software is for. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. It, this this crap kept me out of ham radio for a long time. But, uh, yeah, th this was just the first video I just that was on. This. Shoot, I got I got trouble remember, remember my own name some mornings, let alone trying to learn another language. I tried that back in the 60s yet, man. Man, I just tried it. That was I remember it. pledging a fraternity and I had hard enough time learning a Greek alphabet for heaven's sakes. <laughs> mm. Common mo chokes, but he's got a whole lot of things in our uh, in fed half waves too. They're a sweet antenna, man. They roll up real, real small, throw them in a, a lightweight backpack or a hip pouch, and you're on the road with a little Yezu A17 at six watts talking around the world with a thing slung over top of a palm tree. 
I think it's about the best antenna I've ever had. Uh, you know, you might be able to do better with a Yagi or something like that, but for a wire antenna, I think it's hard to beat them. Yeah, for right. something under for something under two hundred bucks or a hundred bucks. I mean, yeah. Yagi antennas and towers and all that cable. You're talking thousands of dollars. This thing is dirt cheap. This is pennies on the dollar. Mine not to me- not to mention you have to rotate a Yagi. But the biggest thing with it, with that is, yeah, the Yagi is giving you more game, but you're gonna you're excluding so much yeah. that you're you you may end up still missing what you're trying to get. No, mine is like fifteen feet, fifteen to twenty feet above the ground is all. So I don't even have it up very high. I'm going to get up. You did it so you're energy. running what they call a, uh, I'm sorry, Rick, you're running a, uh, what they call NVIS, near vertical okay. incident skywave, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and when we and when you get the right weather conditions, yeah, you can talk to Europe all day long like they're sitting next door. Right. And the neat thing is I talk to say- guys in Atlanta every week, and they keep telling me I've got the strongest signal of the bunch. Of course, we're a QRP bunch, but uh, – we still, uh, I keep getting the strongest signal reports, stronger than the local guys up there with this thing. So it's a pretty good antenna. 15, did you say 15 feet off the ground? 15 feet off the ground. Holy shit. See, wow. these are fed at the high impedance point. So all of this ground sensitivity and everything, of course, it's going to affect the radiation pattern. But uh, I, I tune up on 80 meters and uh, heck, the the, the tuner on the Kenwood just it clicks once and bam, it's ready to go. You don't even need the tuner. I can take the tuner out of the circuit and still use it. Holy yeah, um, I, I use, I just use the internal tuner. Uh, Ian, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the MFJ 1984 on your website and doing a screen share on that. Um, I, I've also found that you can, you can almost, well, you can make them sem- somewhat directional. Uh, by where you put the ground line to. Uh, they work better with a ground line. You're not necessarily required to a ground point. If you look at that picture right there, scroll up now to the right side of the coax connector in, in that photo. Just, no, 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 on the box. There, you see that little nut right there. That's where you want to hook up a ground wire for a, uh, you know, a radial pattern. And if you just take a single wire, you know, 30 foot long, and you put it out at a right angle to that antenna, you will be able to direct that beam. If you put it out parallel in the opposite direction of your antenna, you will direct that beam. If you put it out parallel to the antenna under that antenna wire, you direct that beam. Um, it's relatively simple. Now, I ended up with, with a situation up in New Hampshire where I had uh, the metal edging around the garden, around, you know, I'd say three quarters of the house. And I was able to just clamp a wire onto that little nut stud and clamp it onto that garden edging. And I had, I don't know, 200, 300 foot of, you know, ground plane wire that was anchored into the ground. Boy, what a signal that thing put out though. It was crisp and clear out to Europe. Wow. Dirt cheap, dirt cheap. I look at the price on this thing. What the price on this one is? 70 bucks. That's for the 40 and that's at, you know, that's at what, 64 feet. Now that's probably, that's probably about as big as most of us down here in Florida could get away with. Now, fortunately up in PA in New Hampshire, I was able you know, throw up 164 foot antenna. Um, not down here. <laughs> I don't think my property is 164 foot wide. So I'm able to get down on 75 and you can also run that as a quarter wave on 160. You got to have a separate, wires counterpoise but uh, you can get away with that too Ooh, that's a good idea i may have to i might have to call my brother in new jersey tell them to go to my house in pennsylvania grab my stuff and mail it down to me because i didn't bring any hf stuff down with me this trip yeah i will not make that mistake again Another antenna I want to play with when I get a chance is something called the G7 FEK. Any of, are any of you familiar with that? Say that again. Which what? G7 FEK, Golf 7 Foxtrot Echo Kilo. What it is is an inverted L. Actually, it's back-to-back inverted Ls, which will give you uh, a small space 80-meter antenna. 24 up, 38 over. And uh, 
and the total width is like 46 feet. It's only got to be 25 feet high? Only got to be 25 feet high. But know what's happened down there at the coax. Those two, uh, the two ends of them are tied together. So that's not a, that's not a dipole. That is an inverted, a pair of inverted L's. Oh, wow. Is that, is that tied together yeah. on the center feed yeah. on, on the hot side? Tied together on the center feed. Like I said, they're back to back inverted L's. Yep. Oh. Yeah. And then they, oh. I want to try this thing. I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to put this into my bookmarks right now. Yeah. Hey, but uh, what about what about the grounds? The, the, those those lines look like well, this. Five foot piece of wire from the uh, center feed, and I think it said like thirty. It, it's got all of it, and all the stuff is in there explained. Bring uh, that number back up. The, the G seven F E. G seven F E K. They're actually, I, I've read about these. They're actually have, have pretty good reps, you know, from what I've been able to read up on them. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I had a friend in Atlanta tell me about this, and I've been right. able to try. So just as, a, as something else, to, you know, when my infed's not getting out real good, which it usually does, but uh, I just wanted to see what this would do. But it's a... Gives you an 80 meter antenna and on a postage stamp parking on a postage stamp uh, piece of real estate. Huh, interesting. But note, like I said, down at the bottom there where the uh, hot lead is fed, they're tied together. And you got the, uh, the right side on this is for 40 and the left side is for 80. And then you can, uh, then you can run, as he says, you can run a lot of the other bands with it too, except for 20, but that's a piece of cake to fix that. No kidding. <clears throat> yeah, boy, I, I do like 20 during the day. Oh yeah, 20 is a great band during the daytime. It's my favorite antenna. I just like, you know, a 40 meter infrared halfway will do 20 just beautifully. So what do you do with that bottom wire there? Is it just laying on the ground or is it buried? Well, he, I think he seemed to say, and you might want to read this for yourself, but uh, he actually does that uh, slightly above the ground instead of just putting it on the ground. You pull it up above the ground uh, because you can use a traditional radial system, kind of like you do an ordinary vertical antenna with this, but it's like with this, you don't have to have all that. You just run a 65 foot piece of wire away from and pull it away from pull it in the same direction as that 38 foot section. And then you got to have one there. I think he said 33 feet. Yeah, it's worth it to read the article because he goes into all the details here. G7 FEK is the guy that designed the antenna. And if somebody gets ahead of me and tries it before I do, I want to see what kind of results you get. Hmm. Trying to see what I'm gonna, what I would need. A I piece just, of, uh, just a, a piece, piece of ladder line, really. I mean, it's 450 ohm ladder line and some wire. Cheap. I mean, you want to talk I was about? I going to say there's nothing to this, really. I'm sure they have 450 ohm ladder line for sale at the swap shop tomorrow. First, first one gets there gets it. <laughs> yeah. Some there. Yeah. You go to the store and buy it, it's pretty expensive, but. All right. Well, that's a cool one. All right. Does anybody have anything else? Uh, yeah. You know what, Ian? I think your idea of fixed topics is probably not as good as the random uh, Friday night tech nets here. Uh, Two of these randoms have worked out really well. Yeah, I'm almost, I'm thinking, I'm thinking back and forth every other week as, as kind of what I'm leaning because um, this gives everybody a, more of a chance to to talk about what they want to talk about, which I think is really important. And uh, and then I also think it's important because I have higher numbers on nights where we do, an, like if I do FT8, we have high numbers. You know, if we do something people are really interested in, the numbers go up. 
So I think I think both is important. Maybe we just alternate back and forth. It's also going to be very hard for me to do a big topic every single week and try to prepare everything for it and learn. Yeah, that's that's a lot of work, and you're not getting paid for this. Isn't your job? So don't have time to do it. But yeah, I know. I think this works great. We we've covered a lot tonight. I've I've got a page and a half of notes here. I've got enough stuff to keep me busy for at least a day, just studying <laughs> on this stuff. And and not to mention this stuff out about the wind link earlier. I'm going to be doing all that this weekend too. So I'm I mean, maybe next week Dave can show us when he fires up all his equipment in the background to show us how to bake muffins. He can hold a couple of trays of tins of muffins back there and make, make some biscuits for us. Now I will tell you. I've look out! Look out! He's going to turn it on. There's going to be a brownout. <laughs> hey, my lights just dimmed here in the shack. That that is some impressive looking stuff you got going on there, Dave. Yeah, he just caused a brownout here at the shack. I don't know. Something's wrong. Hey guys, I'd like to talk about noise levels. Mine runs around a nine, and I I don't know if it's my equipment or what's going on, but I had the exact same thing in Pennsylvania. And down here, I have four HF radios and I've tried them all and I'm getting around to nine. Do I need to call somebody or is that pretty much what you got to live with in a city? No, you should not have to live with that down here. Uh, when I have my HF rigs down here, I, I deal with a two to three tops. Yeah, about three is about what I get. Now, I'm going to Yeah, I'm not getting near that much. Well, first, I'm going to run a battery and hook my equipment up to a battery and turn the power to the house off and try it like that. Yeah. Possibility. See if you got a source of noise there. The other thing you might want to look at is your grounding system. What are you using for grounding? Not much. That could be my problem. That might be something to look at. Yeah, could I, be your supply too. Could be your power supply. Um, I know that that Headley KM4 KME had a awful, awful hum buzz in his signals on the traffic net, and he finally got rid of that antique boat anchor power supply. Switched it out. He was dead silent. Um, that was horrible. Yeah. yeah, that was horrible, and it was you know nothing that he did. It was just you know the equipment slowly wore out over time. Hey, just like us, it gets old too. Yeah. Amen, brother. I heard Headley earlier today trying to, uh, well, he called in on the 685 wanting to know if anybody, there was supposed to be a net on here. Where is it? And they told him, well, it's probably gone to Zoom by now. And has he ever been on anywhere on a Zoom meeting? Anybody ever seen him on Zoom? Well, the last time I saw his computer was at Swap Shop two weeks ago, and the mon the uh, it was a laptop, and the hinges were broken, the cables were broken between the body and the monitor, and it wouldn't even power on. So I doubt he's on any kind of computer in any way, shape, or form. That sounds like something I would own. I was wondering. Oh no, 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 no! This is worse. This is worse. <laughs> this this is worse. You couldn't even get it to power up to spin the hard drive to, you know, even without the monitor, because all you got to do is throw it an external monitor on a USB. You can spin it up and, and do a disk image and dump the, the drive off to a disk image and load it onto another PC uh, through image X. It's, you know, that's child's play. You could do that all day long in your sleep, but it's, his, his thing was shot. Hey, Steve, your noise problem might be the grow lights from the house across the street. Yeah, that's possible. Oh, yeah, there is that, too, yeah. Growing funny weeds over there. Yeah, it might be. Smell anything funny growing in the neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> no. Haven't noticed anything. I do notice every morning around 5.30 in the morning, cars pull up and start honking the horn. Oh. There's your answer. Yep. <laughs> Have you taken it? He's had the common courtesy to wait till six. No, in, in, in this neighborhood, that's just somebody picking somebody up for work. Yeah, I, I know, but come on. And you would think the people inside would be waiting because they know they got to go. No. I, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Just right, that. Yeah, that's assuming they're responsible, right? Like being able to afford their own car and their own insurance. Yeah. 
Have you guys seen the, I mean, have you guys, not to get into growing anything specific, but have you seen uh, the, the new technology in grow lights? As we know, with LEDs, you only produce the colors you need, right? Well, all you need is red and blue to grow a plant, which makes purple. Uh, they're having issues in some of these Gee, look places. at your background, red and blue lights. Yeah, it makes purple. Yeah, there you go. And uh, yeah, look at this. Uh, these are pictures of these places um, with these lights. They're really amazing. But when there's a uh, fog that sets, apparently the entire town turns purple nearby. <laughs> Western lights. <laughs> Is that crazy or what? It's almost pretty. I, I think it's beautiful, but uh, but apparently it's cool looking, but it's also an advertisement to every Leo in the area. Yeah. And, and well, I don't mean me, Leo or Leo four, uh, yeah. the, the real Leos. Yeah. <laughs> but I just thought it was so cool how they, uh, they do this now. And, uh, we covered an article a while back. There's a good picture there. We covered an article a while back about how the grow lights um, were reflecting up off of the, off of everything, and they the fog would light up purple. And people were calling the police, saying there was like UFO activity and that there was aliens and there was something crazy going on. And it's like, lady, you must have just moved here. That's the grow house down the street, you know, the, the farm down the street or whatever, where they're growing tomatoes. I think I'd ask her now, what are you smoking? <laughs> smoking some of the product. Everything that grows is not grass, okay? But yeah, I just thought that was. But cool. everything that grows is green. Yeah, I just thought that was kind of cool with the the purple. It just it's this it's that beautiful LED. I'm 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 a sucker for LED lights. It's that beautiful LED purple. Oh God, I man. just love that. But man, that violates the first rule of combat: never do anything that attracts enemy fire, and it pisses those off in the foxhole around you. Yeah, I ain't fighting nobody. All right. Nothing so, like advertising your position, though. I mean, seriously, man. <laughs> Purple girl is glowing in the fog. Oh my god! Yeah, but but <laughs> I guess the disclaimer the disclaimer I need to add on here is that all of these grow lights that I showed you were all from legal grow operations. <laughs> okay, Oops, there was no, must be no, Colorado. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh and I, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you so much. I gotta sign off. Okay. All right, we'll see you guys. Yeah, I'm, I've got to get going soon too. I got to go finish my dinner. Uh, yeah, it's ten o'clock here. I have my dinner over there. Good night, everybody. But I Gotta also, I also, if you guys remember, my motto is I never set it in time and I never rush us out. So I'm trying to hold firm to that. Uh, but if if we're done, we're done. So. Yeah. Well, Ian, thank you for another wonderful evening. Uh, great tech guys. again tonight. All righty, guys. We'll yep. Thanks, Ian. Yep, we'll see you next week, guys. We'll see you at the lunch bunch. Have a good one. I'm good. Okay, seven three, Ian. Seven three.